Um, I want you to meet Katie Herter, who is our staff person, our new staff person working on Israel and Palestine. Yes. Thank you everybody for coming today. Um, this is very important. Today we are standing actually in solidarity with cities all over the country and the world. On Saturday we had 30 cities in the United States take to the streets and protest. We had over a thousand people march in Chicago, so it's very, very awesome that Des Moines is, we are on the map and out here in solidarity. Um, as many of you know, what we are standing here today is to um, hold account Israel for its collective punishment of Palestinian civilians, which is illegal under the Fourth Conven Geneva Convention. Um, over 10 Israeli children have been killed. The Gaza airstrikes are continuing with four deaths as of yesterday, um, and it's on and on and on. Today we have um, two different speakers that will be coming, Julie and Chris, representing Catholic workers and the Lutheran um, Church. <laughs> Chris is a pastor, um, speaking on the both their experiences and the accountability of our taxpayers and the faith communities. We also want to encourage everybody that we have a Monday, the first Monday of every month is our Middle East Peace Education Project in Des Moines, where we work on Israel-Palestine and the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement, outreach to universities. As many of you know, the divestment movement is sweeping across college campuses this last spring. We had several different universities across the U.S. officially divest from Israel, and we're hoping to bring that movement to college campuses here in Iowa. So whether that's you are a student, those students don't need community support, um, as well as when they come to face the backlash of these divestments and running these divestment campaigns on their campuses. I've been appalled this last week about the news coverage of what's been happening over in Israel and Palestine. We get all kinds of little snippets about about the um, the three settlers that were abducted and killed, and then you might get a little news feed about a Palestinian who was captured, tortured, and burned and killed. And then we get a lot of news coverage on um, an American Palestinian boy who was beaten. And my question is, is what about the Palestinian Palestinians? The people that live in Palestine that have been going through this for years and years. Um, this news is not getting out to America. Personally, there, there's lots of things that I've seen just in the small time that I've been in Palestine. The first time that I went, I went to a demonstration outside of Offer Prison where 156 Palestinians were hospitalized, and there wasn't one Western report on that. These were all unarmed protesters fighting against the occupation and indef indefinite detention of their citizens. The first demo that Aaron and I went to this year in the West Bank, there was a Palestinian who was unarmed that was shot by Israeli soldiers, and there wasn't a single headline about that. This was just one demo that we went to. Um, Across the West Bank, there's night raids every single evening where soldiers go in and take pictures of the young children inside their beds so that they can easily identify them during the daylight so they know who belongs to what family. There was a town called Nabi Saleh that we went to. They were having weekly demonstrations, and I overheard one of the men from Nabi Saleh talking to an international, and the international says, why do you let your young children come to these demonstrations? Isn't it dangerous? I cannot believe you let your young children come to these. And he very honestly looked at these people and said, we have to have our children not be afraid of the soldiers that wake them in the night. And so that's why they protest. Uh, there's a young boy who lived in the town that Aaron and I stayed at in Hebron. He lived on our block. His name's Auni. He's 15. He's been brutally abused by all the settlers that live around him. His whole family's been um, accosted and tortured. And Every, and anything that you can imagine to happen to humans happens to this family in Hebron. Um, this boy was beaten in front of soldiers by settlers. And then I was watching a video where Bert pans away and people kind of go, and Alney's on the ground and he's writhing in pain and it pans away and there's another kind of skirmish going. And in the meantime, there's another adult settler came and beat him unconscious on the ground. These things happen all the time. We hear these snippets about this American Palestinian that, get, that was beaten up by soldiers which is absolutely horrific, but it's the Palestinians themselves that we need to bring light to the rest of the world. Uh, these stories are not hard to find. My Facebook is a massacre. If I pull it up every single day and there's pictures of people bleeding on the ground. Um, just one day that I've got, I'm going to quickly go through this, of the news feed that I had, and I was trying to pick out which day should, you know, I just did today. So this is what I had from, from these are my friends in Palestine, these are the headlines I get. Two Palestinians killed in 
Bari refugee camp in the central Gaza Strip by the bombing of Israeli aircraft. Two Palestinians killed by barbaric bombing of Israeli aircraft in Rafah. Six killed in the bombing of a tunnel east of Rafah, pulled out to while four remain under rubble. Violent, violent confrontations between the occupying forces and the youth in Jalzun. Urgent Zionist oppression on the, de on the Gaza Strip, eight dead. Urgent warplanes bomb Gaza International Airport with more than 20 rockets. Israeli police kidnap overnight 110 Palestinians, around half of them are children, after protests that swept across the Arab towns in historic Palestine. Settlers tried to abduct a child east of Yatta. Armed settlers riding in a vehicle chase 14-year-old Palestinian in an attempt to kidnap him for several kilometers down a bumpy road. Confrontations with, with the Israeli occupation forces, forces near, near al Jude University. These are just things that popped up today on my Facebook. Um, you know, I pull up my Facebook and I see pictures of young boys that are bleeding in pools of blood on the ground in Palestine. My friend Karam, who's a medic, I pull up my Facebook one day and he's laying there and there's a boy on the ground and he's got his hand over a gaping wound of a young Palestinian as he bleeds out and dies and he's screaming for help. Um, the things that are going on in Gaza is unmentionable. You can't lock people inside of an outside prison and then bomb them with no way for them to escape. I talked to a Palestinian um, and I asked him, I said, how do you explain to the Americans? They all want to talk about, it doesn't matter what's happening in Palestine, they all want to talk about the rockets being fired out of Gaza. What do I tell the, the Americans about the rockets being fi fired from Gaza? And he said very plainly, look at it this way, if there's a 100 pound man sitting on a bench and a 400 man, pound man comes and sits on top of him, the rockets out of Gaza are that skinny man poking the fat man so there's just enough air so they can breathe. I'd submit to you this is not a conflict of a war or, or over land, that it's over freedom, and that every Palestinian is just fighting for freedom and fighting for air. Hey, hey, hey. thank you, Julie. 2011, I went with the World Council of Churches Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel. This is a three-month project where we're placed in teams and we're there to observe the human rights abuses that are being experienced by both the Palestinian and the Israeli population. But I have to tell you, there's so much more going on in terms of human rights violations in the Palestinian population that that's pretty much what we were doing. We were <coughs> observing just every kind of thing you can imagine. Now, that was 2011, and I've followed the situation through my local contacts since then. And in May, I had the opportunity to go back and work with an organization called Hebron International Resource Network. I saw a village that was at 8 p.m., completely cut off, all their roads closed by the Israeli military. And at around midnight, the military came into the village. I was not there, but I went that next afternoon to take the human rights report with the UN person. The military of about four or 500 soldiers came in. They threw sound bombs into homes made of stone where small children were sleeping. This particular home had five little children sleeping in it from the ages of five to six months of age up to about 10 years of age. Can you imagine waking up with a sound bomb exploding in your house? Soldiers invaded the home. The sound bomb had created a crack in the stone walls, but the soldiers didn't stop there. They went from room to room. They ripped the furniture apart. They kicked the television in. They ripped doors off of the door frames. They took all the clothes out of the dressers. They emptied the closets. They emptied the cupboards in the kitchen. Looking for what? They never said. They arrested a boy 15 years of age. They tied his hands with a zip tie and they took him four kilometers away to an army base where they left him with no charge for four hours and then he was one of the lucky ones. He was released in the middle of the night to walk home in a rural area with the zip tie still on his hands. 
We went to home after home after home in this village where the military had come in and ransacked the homes. We saw these children that had experienced these raids in the night. It was about 4 p.m. when we took the report. It was obvious the kids hadn't slept, that they were afraid. And this is the kind of thing, these kinds of collective civilian punishments that have been going on for so long. You know, Collective civilian punishment, it just sounds like a bunch of words to people over here, but it has a really human face. It's the face of the little children that, uh, that we just heard about. When the soldiers come in the night and wake them up and, and sometimes arrest them. It's the face of, of the man whose home is demolished. So many homes have been demolished. And the escalation that's going on right now in Hebron, I know of in one week, there were 10 homes that were invaded and at least seven of them were demolished. And they were civilian homes of people that had absolutely nothing to do with the search for the kidnappers or, you know, they were just, they happened to have homes that were built in places that uh, Israel didn't want the homes built there. I, I don't even know how to end this except to say that the collective punishments of the civilian population in the West Bank are an egregious human rights crime that is ongoing, that has to be stopped. And silence is complicity. I mean, every day we're paying for this military. Uh, there is a law on the books in the United States, it's called the Leahy Law. And it explicitly says, if an entity that receives United States funds is found to be perpetrating human rights abuses, an investigation must be held. And if that investigation is substantiated, aid must be withdrawn. We have got to actually implement the Leahy Law and call Israel to account for the kinds of treatment that they are doing against these civilians. Thank you. Well, I just want to thank everybody for coming, and I want to, um, you know, note, as has been said, around the country, this campaign is building. This campaign needs to build in Iowa, and you're all a part of it now. So we hope to see you at our next meeting at the Friends House, third Monday of the month at 6.30. We need to build this campaign. We need to pick up.